Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Allen. I am a PhD student in the marketing department. And I'll be presenting a version of my job market paper, quantifying the impact of misinformation and vaccine skeptical content on Facebook. Here we go. So as I'm sure everyone in the room is aware by now, uh, vaccine refusal is a big issue in the US. And so one in five people in the US refuse to take a vaccine for COVID, despite it being safe and effective for almost everyone. So why did so many people refuse such a life-saving vaccine? Well, there are obviously a lot of potential explanations, but one that gained a lot of traction was the idea that misinformation spreading on social media, particularly Facebook, was responsible for the low vaccine uptake in the U.S. And so Joe Biden was actually quoted as saying that Facebook and other social media companies were killing people by carrying vaccine uh, misinformation on the platform. And so the question that I had uh, as part of my job in the paper was, you know, is this correct? What would it really take for misinformation to have this big impact that is so commonly ascribed to it? Well, when you think about it, you can break down this idea of impact as being related to two key components. First, exposure. How many people saw the content? And the second is persuasive effect. What effect did it have on people's future intentions uh, or willingness to get a vaccine? And the intuition behind this framework is that for content to be broadly impactful at the scale of society, people have to see it and it has to change their mind. Um, and so I kind of take this approach and take this framework and I apply it to answer this research question that I put forth earlier, which is, you know, did misinformation on Facebook have a big meaningful impact on US vaccine hesitancy. But I actually also go a step further. And I don't just look at misinformation on Facebook in isolation, but I compare the impact of misinformation to that of content that was not flagged as misinformation by Facebook. And the idea here is that there's been a lot of attention on misinformation, on false content spreading online. Um, there's been a lot of interventions, a lot of energy, uh, a lot of work putting into kind of preventing misinformation. But misinformation is only a small part of the content that people actually see online. There's a lot else that's out there that really hasn't been as scrutinized. And when the research question isn't just, did people see misinformation, but why did people not get a vaccine? Well, maybe we shouldn't just be zeroing in on misinformation as the only possible um, reason for why that, that might be occurring. And so I'm taking a really high level view of the entire information ecosystem. And so just to give an overview of, of where this is going and you know, how I've organized this paper, I'm obviously not going to go into an incredible amount of detail given the time. Um, but just to give you know, this high level overview, first, I'm going to talk about this exposure component. Um, and I'm going to talk about a data set that we got access to that allowed us to uh, measure the number of times uh, 13,000 different vaccine-related headlines were seen on Facebook during the initial rollout of the COVID vaccine during the first quarter of 2021, when people were making their decisions about whether or not to get a vaccine. Next, I'm gonna talk about this persuasion component um, and talk about randomized survey experiments we ran uh, measuring the treatment effects of 130 different vaccine-related items on people's future willingness to get a vaccine. Um, next, I'm gonna start putting this exposure and persuasion together. Um, and talk about a pipeline that uh, we built um, using crowdsourcing and natural language processing to extrapolate the results of these survey experiments to this larger set of Facebook content in order to get predicted treatment effects for the entire set of Facebook content in our data set. Then I you know, put these predicted treatment effects with the exposure data in order to uh, you know, put it all together uh, and in order to get uh, the overall impact of Facebook content on people's future intentions to get a vaccine. Yeah, so there's a lot going on. Obviously, we won't uh, go into super depth, but I definitely encourage people to read the paper if they're interested. Okay. So moving on to the data. As I said, uh, first talking about this exposure component, we got access to this really unique data set called the Facebook URL Shares data set, um, which contained data about all URLs publicly shared greater than 100 times on Facebook and the number of views uh, of those URLs. So how many unique people saw each URL on Facebook? And so from this data set, we identified 13,000 URLs that were about the vaccine 
um, posted during the first three months of 2021. Again, when people are making the, their decisions about whether or not to get a vaccine. And in the status that we defined misinformation as URLs that had been flagged um, as such by third party fact checkers. So all the URLs that fact checkers said were false, partly false, et cetera, um, were uh, misinformation for the purposes of um, this project. Okay. So now uh, this persuasion component. So we ran two randomized survey experiments on uh, the survey platform Lucid um, on a set of representative Americans testing 130 different vaccine-related treatments on uh, about 20,000 subjects. And the stimuli here were a sample of popular vaccine news um, drawn mostly from Facebook, but spanning a variety of different topics, um, both misinformation and factually accurate content from a variety of different news sources, some mainstream media, some you know, low quality news, uh, and, and pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine. So the idea here was to get a large and varied set of vaccine-related content. Um, and for each one of these treatments, uh, we estimated the persuasive effect of exposure to one of these stories um, compared to a control story that was just not related to the vaccine on people's future intentions to get a COVID vaccine. So this is just an example of what this content looked like. We showed people content as if you know they were seeing it scrolling on Facebook. We had things uh, you know from you know high quality outlets like BBC as well as low quality outlets like Gateway Pundit. Um, so just to give you a glimpse of what this looked like. Okay. So moving on to the methodology, and again here this is kind of a lightning talk, um, but just to give uh, an overview. Um, we have our treatment effects uh, for our 130 different vaccine-related items. We have these 13,000 Facebook headlines. Um, and what we want is predicted treatment effects for all Facebook headlines. And so we get this by you know, building a pipeline that uses crowdsourcing and natural language processing to, gen to generalize the results of these treatment effects to this larger set of Facebook content. It's kind of got messed up, but that's okay. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into uh, all the gory details, but one kind of really interesting finding that we had is we asked people uh, on, um, you know, crowd workers to rate how persuasive they thought each of these treatments were. We asked them, you know, do you think that this headline would increase or decrease people's willingness to get a vaccine? And we averaged together all their responses to create uh, this crowdsourced aggregate score here. And we use this score to predict um, the actual treatment effects that we observed in, uh, in our experiments. And we find that it actually, um, there's, there's a good uh, predictive power here. And so there's a correlation of about 0.75 once you account for the sampling error um, in these treatment effects. And so the crowd is actually able to predict variation in the treatment effects to a reasonably high degree. But one thing to note here is that if you split this uh, crowdsource score at the midpoint, which I've done here, um, there's a lot of content that lowers people's willingness to get a vaccine, but very little content that actually increases people's willingness to get a vaccine. And so um, there's a lot here that's below zero and like essentially nothing, you know, increasing people's willingness to get a vaccine. And so because of this asymmetry, uh, we're mostly going to focus on content that is lowering people's willingness to get a vaccine because um, our question is really related to vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so, you know, it seems like the crowd is doing a pretty good job, uh, but the crowd is really not sufficiently scalable here. And so we have 13,000 headlines, and eventually um, the idea would be this is a, a pipeline that platforms or other researchers could use. And so um, ultimately the crowd is not going to be sufficiently scalable. And so as a solution, um, we uh, use natural language processing. And so we gather crowd labels for a sample of our uh, headlines of these 13,000 headlines, and then trained a BERT model to predict these crowd labels from the headlines and descriptions of each of these URLs. Um, and, you know, this, this does a pretty good job as well. And so uh, we have this pipeline um, of crowdsourcing and natural language processing that we use to get predicted treatment effects for these 13,000 headlines in our data set. Okay. Um, so I think some of my animations uh, got a little discombobulated, but that's okay. Um, but so just to look at the distribution of the headlines here. Um, so uh, this plot here on the right, is that right, left, um, are the predicted URL treatment effects for misinformation and not uh, content that was not flagged as misinformation respectively. And so as you can see, uh, misinformation, when people see it, 
has a much more negative impact on their intentions to get a uh, future intentions to get a vaccine than content that isn't flagged as misinformation. So if you look at this plot, um, you think that misinformation is really the problem here. When people see it, it's it's really bad. But what happens when you weight each of these treatment effects by the number of times it was seen on Facebook, um, which is this plot here? It's a totally different story. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of content that is almost as negatively persuasive as misinformation, but that is being seen vastly, vastly more times than misinformation was. And so I actually had to rescale the y-axis on this plot to even get misinformation to show up on this at all. And so there's a lot of content that is not being flagged as misinformation, but that we see is having you know, a predicted negative effect on people's future intentions to get a vaccine. And so, you know, persuasion is only uh, part of the story. And exposure actually has, uh, carries a lot of weight here. Um, and so we call this content vaccine skeptical. And we use this term to refer to content that is not being flagged as misinformation, is not failing a fact check, but is nonetheless predicted to cause vaccine hesitancy. And so, you know, what is this content? So I'm going to show the top stories that we have weighted by the number of times they were actually seen, um, the, the top most kind of negative, negatively impactful stories that we have weighted by the number of times they were seen. And the most negatively impactful story we have in our data set is this one here. Um, it's published by the Chicago Tribune with the headline, a healthy doctor died two weeks after getting a COVID vaccine. The CDC is investigating why. And so, you know, this headline was not false. It did not, you know, fail a fact check. Uh, it's accurate. A doctor did die after getting a vaccine. Um, but we can see that uh, it, content like this in our experiments um, and uh, in our models was predicted to lower people's willingness to get a vaccine. And it was seen by 50 million people on Facebook, um, which is actually more than five times all of misinformation combined. And so, and it actually just wasn't this story. There's a lot of different examples of this phenomenon of people uh, or of mainstream media outlets covering these rare deaths following vaccination with maybe some connection um, that hasn't been kind of fully demonstrated um, that are getting an incredible amount of traction on social media despite not being false. Um, and so just to wrap up, um, we do see that when people see it, misinformation can have a large negative impact on people's intentions to get a vaccine compared to factually accurate content. But people don't really see it very often. And it is instead this gray area content, this vaccine skeptical content, that had a much bigger predicted impact on vaccine intentions than the outright false claims. So 50 times the predicted impact uh, the, um, once, you, once you account for exposure. And so just to leave you, um, if uh, by identifying content based on its predicted harmful impact, and not just myopically looking at you know, false content at misinformation. Um, researchers and also platforms could really much better uh, prevent the harmful impacts of their platforms. And so that I'm, I'm done. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions.